Salute, Mob Tube. How's everybody doing today? Um, as you guys know, I'm looking forward to this. I'm sure you guys are too. Um, this is something, you know, that uh, that I've wanted to do for a long, long time. I've heard about and I've been reading about the Bath Avenue crew for years. I've done a lot of research on them. Now we have Jimmy on his channel uh, telling us a lot of stories and filling in some blanks. So that's been great. And um, I'm going to have Jimmy on. And what I'm going to do is, even though a lot of us know a lot of the story, um, you know, a lot of us have, you know, heard a lot of Jimmy's stories and we know a lot about them already. I want to work from the beginning to the end. So I'm going to go over everything with Jimmy. Um, he knows this. He's, he's fine with it. So um, I hope we get a lot of people in here and we're going to have a good show. So let me bring on Jimmy Calandra. Hey, Jimmy. What's up, Chris? How's everything? Good, man. How you doing? Good. Uh, yeah, I had to keep my glasses on because I can't even see these comments without them. Man. I'm getting old. Me too. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I, I don't think either one of us expected to make it past probably 30 years old. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I'd like to start off, like I just told the audience, I want to start off at the beginning. I want to know your whole story from beginning to end. I want to make this a really uh, complex interview. So if you could start off by telling us about your childhood and where you grew up. Well, I really had a good childhood. I come from a good family. My father worked the same job for over 35 years. Uh, you know, I was born in Methodist Hospital, Brooklyn, New York. When I was born, my parents lived on Bay 22nd and Bath. I mean, that's on my birth certificate. Uh, I have a sister and brother. I have a good family. Uh, I have a big family. My grandmother had 15 kids. Wow. Uh, my father's Italian. My mother's Italian. Uh, I really had a great upbringing as far as a childhood. Uh, the neighbor I grew up in was a great neighborhood. Uh, but there were certain areas of the neighborhood, certain parts of the neighborhood, the mafia controlled. And, you know, that also made the neighborhood good, but it also made the neighborhood bad, you know, because they had the power to control that. And if you got out of order, eventually you would get killed. It would be easy to get killed back then, you know, just by the snap of a finger, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but uh, I did have a good childhood. You know, I used to love to play basketball ball with my friends, softball, uh, stickball, stuff like that. Back in the day, flipping baseball cards and playing Skelzy and stoop ball. You know, that's how I grew up. A lot different than the way the kids grew up today. Oh, yeah, I'll say uh, it's nothing like it used to be. Uh, kids aren't, aren't the, they're not the same type of kids we were. They're not doing the same things. It was, it was a lot different because even when you left the house, you either get a Charlie horse or a slap in the neck. You know, it was more rough and tumble than today. You know, everything today, if you say something, you're insulted. And uh, but it was a different world. It was a, a great place to grow up looking back. I wish I could go back at those times and, you know, do things a little different. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, I lost a lot of friends at an early age. And uh, every time I talk about it, I relive it. So... Yeah, I'm sure it's not easy. Um, I wanted to talk next then about uh, basically as a child, um, you know, just preteen years uh, around that age, some of the friendships you made, people you were close with, other kids. I know Fabrizio uh, lived in the same building as you. So if you could tell us about Georgie and, and, and some of the other kids you grew up around, that would be good. Yeah, well, you know, my original childhood friends were Georgie Adamo, Fabrizio DeFranziski, uh, Albert Slavin, there's uh, John Padone, some kid Damien that used to live on base at, uh, 17th there and you eventually he moved, and some other kid, John Bauman, John LaBarca, Dean Benicillo, and then eventually John Polio moved to the neighborhood and he became friendly with us. Tommy Reynolds was from 15th Avenue. Eventually he came to the neighborhood. We became friends with him. Joey Calco was from Bay 14th. And uh, 
In the beginning, we weren't friendly with Joey Calco. We always beef with Joey Calco. Joey Calco came into our crew later on in life. But uh, me and Fabrizio grew up in the same building. Little Giorgio Adamo, he was the, he connected the dots to the mafia, Little Giorgio, because his godfather was Anthony Sparrow, and he also was baptized by Eddie Lino, and Georgie also had a father that was around wise guys. He was a street guy. He wasn't a wise guy, but he was killed later on. So uh, 1975, he was killed. And this is what connected us to the mob, little Georgie Adamo. Yeah. Um, I want to pull up some pictures, actually, of some of the guys you spoke about. Uh, I'm going to start with the pictures of you guys as children. Um, if you want to tell us what uh, who everybody is in these pictures. That's uh, <laughs> that's little Georgie. We're visiting him at, I think that was Elmira. We took a bus to go see him. I, that's my brother on the side of me. And that's little Sammy, one of my uh, dear friends back in the day. He's a Sicilian kid. He's a good kid. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a uh, prison pr picture a long, long time ago. He was about 18 years old, Georgie, at that time. Wow, you guys look so young. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Yeah, that's uh, me, Georgia Adamo, and John Polio. Okay. Yeah, a lot of people, you know, there's not a lot of pictures out there of John Polio. Um, I'm actually going to put another one up right here. Yes, that's John Polio with our Bad Avenue jersey. That was a football jersey we had. That was the powder blue. Uh, whenever, every season when we played football, we would go to Joe Torrey's on 13th Avenue, and Joe Torrey's would make our jerseys. We would create the colors, and he would put our jerseys together. Like, we were always very excited about that growing up, getting jerseys every year, and they would be different colors. So, uh, yeah, that, those were nice times. Yeah. Um, here's another one of you and Georgie. That's me and Georgie. There's a couple other people in this picture. This is uh, – a picture where Georgie actually has the Western beef hat on. This is when we were going to, to work with Mikey Scars de Leonardo. Mikey Scars wasn't a wise guy yet, but he was one of the better guys in my neighborhood. He would pick us up at all of our houses with his big Lincoln, and he would take us to work, and we would run the produce department. We would rotate the produce, and we would also fight with some of the kids in the neighborhood in East Orange, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Here's um. What we also used to do is we also we also used to like have tomato fights. We'd get tomatoes, and he'd be across like the way, and we'd be throwing tomatoes at each other. But it was funny because Frankie Castellano, he it was his place. He loved us as young kids because we were wild little kids, and we never listened. We were like the dead end kids. And, uh, you know, he just got a kick that out of us. When we were kids, all these guys had a good time with us and they got a kick out of us. Yeah. So even back then, even as little kids, you were call, causing havoc, getting in some sort of trouble. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we were, we were having fun. I mean, you know, at that time it was fun. I mean, it was a kick to them, to the older guys. And, uh, you know, listen, we didn't, you know, you know, this life, we didn't know what was about to take place and what was the future for all of us. You know, if I knew the future for all of us, you know, we probably would have took different paths. And uh, unfortunately, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, here's another one, I believe, of you guys as children. This is this is a really old picture. That's Frank Amari in the number 23 or 22. And... The guy that has his arm behind me is Sally Massimillo. He had a brother, Anthony Massimillo, that was a cop that was killed. He was a really good guy. But I know these guys all my life. And Georgie has the Pittsburgh shirt, uh, jacket on. And actually, that blue jacket that I'm wearing, uh, Frankie Amari, that we used to have a Corvette in our neighborhood. Frankie Amari stole that jacket from me. That blue oh, really? jacket right there. Yes. And we took that photo. But that's a, that's an old photo back in the day. We we were maybe, 
I would say in that photo, 10, 11 years old. Yeah, I was going to say, you look very, very young. I think out of all of them, uh, you, it looks like this one might be the oldest picture. And Georgie, at that time, was smoking cigarettes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that young, huh? I think that I was, young. too. So, <laughs> um, yeah, when we, lived, when we lived in Glendale, uh, I remember being six, seven years old, and I would steal cigarettes out of my mom's pack. She smoked Merritt Ultralights. And uh, me and this girl that lived above us, we would go to the corner. There was this old man that lived there, and he had real tall bushes. And we would hide behind the bushes and smoke cigarettes. <laughs> That's what we used to do. I mean, I took a couple talks of cigarettes, but I was the one that never got hooked on cigarettes. When I used to inhale, I used to get dizzy. Yeah. So I said, no, it wasn't for me. But my friends used to love to smoke cigarettes, you know. Yeah, me too, unfortunately. It's a bad habit to start. <laughs> Um, so here's another one while we're talking about Georgie. Uh, this is actually um, him and Anthony Spiro. That's uh, at Georgie's communion. He uh, Spiro stood in for Georgie and uh, he basically adopted Georgie after his father was murdered. And uh, yeah, that's a picture at Georgie's communion. So you also said uh, Georgie was connected to Eddie Lino, basically, as a child, right? Eddie Lino uh, actually baptized Georgie when he was a baby. That's Eddie Lino right there. He baptized. He was very good friends with Georgie Crowbar, Georgie's father. And uh, the guy, Jerry Papa, I'm sure you heard of Jerry Papa. Oh, yeah. He's the one who actually killed Georgie's father. You know, that's how the neighborhood was. It, listen, the neighborhood at that time, it was a sick neighborhood. It's very hard to explain. If you come from the neighborhood, you understood the neighborhood. But people were getting killed left and right. You know, all these guys, a guy like uh, Eddie Lino was a mad hatter. You know, uh, Georgie's father was a mad hatter. These are guys that you're never going to see again. Uh, the, that's when the mob was the mob, yeah. you know. So when did you guys, uh, like, at what age around did you start to form a little crew? And who were the original members of that crew? The original members of the Bad Day Avenue crew was Albert Slavin, me, Georgie Adamo, Fabrizio, John Padone, John LaBarca, and some kid Damien. Now, as we got older, then you had other kids that would come around. And when other kids came around, you know, we really didn't accept other kids. They would hang out with us for a couple of days. Then we would jump them and beat them up. You know, <laughs> when we were kids, we were like, basically, if you fought one of us, you had to fight all of us. You know, you could, I mean, you really couldn't get a fair one because, you know, that, that's how we were. You know, but uh, little Georgie at that time, he was the leader of our crew because he had the connections. He was Sparrow's godson. And, uh, you know, we followed Georgie's lead. You know, Georgie's the one who brought us into, you know, going into social clubs and, you know, all these guys looking at us. And we were really young kids and they got a kick out of us, you know, and they would just hand us a $20 bill. Here, put that in your pocket. You got money on your head. Put that in your pocket. You know, if they needed something, if they need a loaf of bread, hey, you know, go get me Italian bread, go get me a French bread. I say French bread because the French breads are the long, skinny ones. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we would also collect envelopes for them. You know, go to this guy over here. He's going to give you an envelope, come back with it, drop it off. But, you know, these are the little errands we did. And uh, eventually, as you grow up, it leads to other things. Yeah. Well, we've heard about some of the guys you spoke about in your stories and in you know news articles and, and other things, but guys like John Padone, for example, I don't believe you ever um, told us in any of your uh, videos what happened with John Padone and who he was in the crew. Yeah, John Padone was a great kid. I talk about him, I get choked up because... He's one of my childhood friends, and he was a really good kid where he had a big personality. Yeah. And he lived on 17th Avenue and Bath. And when we were kids, he was one of the first kids who had the VHS and WHT. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so we used to go to his house at nighttime and watch movies. And we watched the movie one time in his building. He lived in like a 32 apartment apartment building. And we watched the movie Dressed to Kill with, An with Angela Dickinson. Yeah. And, and it was it was really scary. So when we left his house, like we had to walk through this building. We were like, oh, shit. You know, is anyone going to come out of the dock and get us and slash us <laughs> or something? But yeah, John Padone was such a great kid. He passed away about a week after my mother passed away. It's about nine years ago. And uh, it was really a surprise to me. And uh, I really loved that kid a lot. He was a really good kid. And he's one of uh, the kids with me and Georgia Adamo, original Beth Avenue kid. And uh, But he had a big personality. I missed that kid. And uh, it just breaks my heart even thinking about him. Yeah. Why didn't he um, stick with you guys? Why wasn't he later on a member? Or was he well, still around? No, he, he was around. What happened was he had two older brothers. And uh, he was basically, he shied away from all the trouble that oh, we yeah. were in. You know, uh, we would hang out with him. He would be in the bars with us. He had a big pot connection. And, uh, but when it got down to the trouble, he was just hanging out with some other kids on the Avenue that were friendly with us. But he was a smart kid, you know, and uh, his brothers probably told him, you know what, stay away from them. You know, they're, you know, they're getting a little too much involved in certain things. Yeah. So once you guys got into deeper and more serious crimes, he basically kept his distance to, to, uh, to yeah. him, him, him and little Georgia Adamo, when we were kids, they actually caught the first case. They beat up some kid and the kid ended up pressing charges on them. The kid they beat up at this time, they were maybe 13, 14 years old and the kid pressed charges and they had to go to court for maybe 18 months, two years uh, until they end up getting uh, some kind of probation or something. But, uh, yeah, John Padone was definitely one of the original Bath Avenue kids. He had a great personality. He was a funny kid. That kid went to more Super Bowls than anybody. Really? And, uh, yeah. But uh, he was he was a great kid. And when did you guys start? I've heard you say as teenagers you were doing things like bookmaking, running numbers, uh, sports betting, stuff like that. What age around did you did you start to get into those types of crimes? You and your crew. Yeah, we uh, that was probably in our teens. We started doing that. You know, we started, actually, we started making bets. We got into making bets. And, uh, you know, then Bobby the Chico came around with the, uh, he had the phones. So we started gambling with him. Then we had the football tickets. We'd be passing them around. And, uh, but yeah, we started real young uh, doing all that. I would actually lend out money to my friends like a hundred dollars and maybe charge five dollars on a hundred dollars at that time you know i would borrow money from bobby the chico and give it to my friends and charge five dollars on a hundred not all my friends a couple of my friends you know there's a lot of kids i don't talk about there's another kid richard keenan he ended up passing away and uh but there's 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 a lot of kids that are no longer here from that neighborhood, you know? And uh, that neighborhood was, uh, you know, it, it was nice growing up, but the outcome of it was, it's either you got hooked on drugs, you went to prison, you got murdered, or eventually, just like me, I had to cooperate to get out of my troubles. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it always turns out, uh, one of three ways usually, uh, but what, when did it get to the point where it was, you know, the five main members of, of the Bath Avenue crew, you, Joey, Paulie, uh, Tommy, Fabrizio, when did it get to that point? And the two other guys that were obviously involved and had the numbers on their legs, Mikey, I mean, and Anthony Gonzalez, when did it get to the point where that was the Bath Avenue? Well, as as we were growing up, 
we had pot spots and we would get pot off a guy by the name of Georgie Conti. Georgie Conti was eventually, he became a captain in the Lucchese crime family. But before he was a captain, we were getting weed off of him and we had pot spots. So we would get pot from him. Say, for example, me, Polio, Albert Slavin, and uh, Tommy Reynolds, okay? We were partners in a pot spot. There's some pictures of us floating around, all four of us together on a corner. And we would go to Georgia and get pot off him. He would give us a quarter pound at a time. At that time, it was Thai stick, skunk weed, sense a million. That was really the good weed. You know, compared to the weed today, now it's all medical weed and, you know, blue crush and all that crazy shit. Yeah. You know? But uh, the tie stick used to be, you know, tie is be tied around the stick and it was really good. But now, say, for example, we were partners, all four of us. Say me and John Polio went to go pick up the weed that day. When we picked up the weed, me and Polio, we would take like a little thing of weed for each of us. We would put it in our pocket, you know, and then we would tell the other two guys that we were partners with, yeah, you know, this is what he gave us. And then we would go bag it up. we go to our corner and we would sell it. We would make a profit. You know, we make a couple hundred dollars a night as a profit. But that's how we started. You know, John Polio is, is one of the kids who came later on. He was originally from Bay 50th. He came to the neighborhood later on and he taught us everything about pot and graffiti. He got us into the graffiti thing. You know, so... It was uh, it was actually cycles of life growing up as a teenager. You know, you wear the windbreakers, and then you got the you're, you're tagging up, and then you you know you're bombing the the yards, the bus yards, and the sanitation yards. And the next morning, we see the sanitation trucks going by with our tags on it. You know, mm -hmm. and who ain't there? You're throwing up your friend too. You know. So, you know, we had, uh, you know, my name was Pac, P-A-K. You know, Polio was I-D. Little Georgie was Zap, Z-A-P. Fabrizio was Zep, Z-E-P. So we all had names and we tagged up, you know, and we'd be B-A-B, Bath Avenue boys. Yeah. You know, but uh, that's how, you know, it all started. Then we had these St. Finbar dances on Bath Avenue, and we would all go to the St. Finbar dances and our windbreakers, and at the end of the night, we would have fist fights with the other kids in there. So, you know, that's basically the starting point of, you know, just our neighborhood. It was our neighborhood growing up, and these are the things we did. Yeah, and before I get too far ahead, um, the murder of John Polio. The murder of John Polio Till this day, I honestly really don't know the reason. The reason I would say behind it is, you know, it's either he flirted with somebody's wife or they just didn't like him. You know, he had three sisters and it was just him. Uh, he wasn't originally from our neighborhood and a couple guys didn't like him. You know, there was a guy, Frankie Maraconda, that didn't like him at this time. Uh, Frankie Maraconda, Georgie Conti, Charlie Tuna, Scotty Fapp. You know, these guys turned us on to cocaine when we were kids. You know, we were cut out of school. We would go to, say, for example, we would go to Scotty's house, Scotty Fappiano. He put lines on the table. We would snort a line. We were teenagers, you know, and then we would be playing cards. We'd be playing knuckles, you know, or uh, gin rummy. But this is, you know, how... It all began starting like that. And uh, Polio, you know, once he was murdered, that's when we formed the Beth Avenue crew. You know, once one of your friends get murdered and you're a young kid, I was 18 at the time John Polio was murdered. He was 19. He died April 4th, 1988. And... I had the attitude, you know what, when he got killed, I was like, you know, I want to die too. So we all started carrying around guns, you know, and Tommy Reynolds' father was a street guy. And he told us, he said, whatever you do, don't get in nobody's car. Because at this time, when it first happened, we didn't know who did it, you know, but we knew whoever did it 
knew him because he got into somebody's car. Yeah, um, I, and I got another question about that, actually. I just want to bring up this super chat real quick. Uh, William Kuhn says, salute FBS. I'm loving the show. Ask Jimmy what he thinks about all these guys claiming they were made when they weren't. Well, I think they're all full of shit. You know, I, I don't want to get into uh, these guys that I really don't care for. But uh, listen, you know what? Let them live their life. I want to live my life in peace. And, uh, you know, I don't want to knock nobody. Whatever they want to do with themselves, they want to claim to be made. Go ahead. Claim to be made. You're made. God bless you. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to try to leave any more questions till the end, guys, just to let you know. Um, so after polio was murdered, that's what started the whole thing with Mikey Hamster, correct? After John Polio was murdered, what happened was it's really a deep story because, see, I was friendly with this guy, Bobby DeChico, okay? Yeah. Now, Bobby DeChico, in the beginning, he came from Vegas. He used to be a car dealer, okay? Now, when he came from Vegas, you know, he came to Nick's Candy Store with his father, Georgie DeChico, started talking to all of us, me and my friends. Now, listen, we were young kids, so you could talk to us. We could talk about sports. Me and Tommy Reynolds, we used to gamble all the time. We used to make bets. We used to make parlays. And, uh, you know, that's what we did. But, uh, you know, we started talking about gambling. Uh, then we started becoming friendly. You know what? At this time, when you were just a teenager, you could be 14 years old, you were allowed to walk in a bar, and they would serve you a drink in our neighborhood. You yeah. can't do that today. You yeah. know, but that's how it was. So he would say, you know what? Hey, you want to go out to dinner uh, tonight or tomorrow night? So me and my friends, we were piling his car, and we go out to dinner. You know, I mean, we looked up to these guys. You know, we admire these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny what you said about, uh, you know, back then being able to walk into a bar. Now you you damn near got to go through a background check just to get into a bar. <laughs> it's in, it's totally insane. Crazy. It, yeah, it's crazy. But uh, back in the day, our neighborhood, you had all local bars. And they knew who we were. The bartender knew who we were. And they would just let us in. And they would just throw a, a, a thing on the table. What do you want? You know, just, yeah, give me a beer, you know. And uh, by the time you know you have a couple of beers, you're a young kid, and you're, you're a little drunk, and they're making fun of you. Yeah. You know? Um, so I want to talk about, you know, more about the Mikey Hamster thing and what the outcome was with him, because what we never found out from you is, you know, what happened with him after the, all the attempts on his life? Is he alive today? Is he healthy? Uh, what he, do you know? He is alive today. The Mikey Hamster thing was, he was also, what happened was, it started with Bobby the Chico was friendly with me and my friends. Okay. Yeah. Now. Me and my friends were street kids. Now, Bobby the Chico, he didn't like to have anything to do with drugs. So we were also dabbling with drugs. We were getting drugs off of Georgie Conti, and we were selling them. Eventually, I have a beef with Georgie Conti, and I tell Mikey Scars. Mikey Scars isn't made at this time. Mikey Scars goes to his father-in-law, Robert Fapiano. That's Tony Marie's father. And I go to talk to Robert Fapiano. As I'm talking to Robert Fapiano, I talk with my hands. So I'm saying, you know, Robert, you know, uh, yeah, I have a problem with Georgie. And I just see Robert looking at me with my hands as I'm talking. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and this guy's a wise guy with the Gambino family. And so <laughs> at the end of the conversation, he says, Jimmy, you know what? I'm going to talk to Georgie. Uh, in the meantime, don't get into nobody's car and just, uh, you know, if you see Georgie, try to avoid him. So obviously he spoke to Georgie. I'm standing in front of Nick's candy store and uh, Georgie Conti pulls up and he says, hey, Jimmy. And I, and I walk over to the car. Hey, Georgie, how you doing? And he says, uh, everything OK? You all right? I said, yeah. Like he turned from Frankenstein to... Like, he was a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. All of a sudden, he became a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess Robert had a conversation with him. 
And, uh, you know, that's how my neighborhood was. You know, in that neighborhood, you can't just walk away from that life, you know, unless you just walk away from the neighborhood and go to another state. Because there ain't no such thing as walking away from that life. You can't walk away from your old friends. It just don't go that way, you know, because then people start knocking you and they start making up rumors about you. But the neighborhood, you know, the neighborhood was a serious neighborhood growing up. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, now we're now that we're at this point where we're, where we're talking about, you know, really forming the Bath Avenue crew and when you guys started, um, you know, started kind of taking revenge on people that hurt your friends. I want to put up some pictures of the different members of the crew, just so everybody knows for the people that haven't seen pictures of them. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, Paulie G. Yes, that's Paulie G. Okay, and then um, there's a picture of you with Paulie also. Yes, Paulie G was a great kid. Yeah, from what we've heard you say. Paulie G was a type of kid, if he was your friend, he had your back. Yeah. Yeah, from everything you've said in your stories, I can tell that. uh, When when John Paulie was murdered, Paulie G got a memory piece of John Paulie on his leg. Now, when he got that memory piece, Georgie Conti really didn't like that because, you know, it's like saying, you know, you, now what you're doing is you're saying that you love this kid. You put a memory piece on his lake, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, Paulie G was an up and coming kid at the time, you know, but there's so many stories behind the story. You know, I could tell you a story when we were playing stickball. I was yeah. a quick we were playing stickball, and Georgie Conti was on the stickball league. This kid that didn't know that Georgie Conti was a wise guy, he ends up slapping Georgie Conti. Paulie G jumps in, gives the kid a beating. And, you know, that's how Paulie G was. You know, so, uh, you know, Paulie G was a really good kid. You know, it's terrible the way... He went out, you know, by his own friends. And, uh, but, you know, I guess that's a part of that life. You know, it's just something where, you know what, I could never kill my own friends. That's understandable. And that actually brings me to a question before I bring up more pictures, because I know people wonder about this. But what do you think as far as, you know, what if Joey and Tommy said no? said no to Spiro, that no, we're not going to do that to our friend. What well, would be the outcome? Yeah, well, well the thing is, you, you're not going to say no. Yeah. Okay, what you're going to do is, you could give Paulie G a heads up and say, listen, Paulie, they want me to kill you. We got to get the fuck out of here. You know? I mean, you know, we got to get out of here. If not, we're fucking dead. If not, we're going against these guys. And listen, eventually we're going to die. You know, let's get the fuck out of here. Let's make time go by. But, you know, that didn't happen. You know, they, they took the assignment and it was probably maybe a little more than just pushing Sparrow. I'm sure somebody had green eyes as far as money. Paulie G at the time was getting 10000 a week drug money. And, uh, you know, we were dividing that money up. So, uh, you know, someone had an idea. Someone had a light bulb. And... You know, we were all loyal to Paulie G before we were loyal to, Sp- to to Sparrow and Joe Benanti. Now you take Paulie G out of the picture. Now we got to be loyal to you, you know. And, uh, you know, that's how the mob works. So I'm sure it was more than just pushing Sparrow. There was a little more to it. There was also green eyes where there was money involved, you know. So, and... uh. You know, Joey Calco, he ends up killing Paulie G, as we know. And, uh, you know, he thought he was going to get straightened out and get a button. Then then he ends up killing the 19-year-old, and he has to go to Italy. Of course, they're looking for him. Who gets straightened out? Fabrizio Di Franziski. You know, and I would never, ever think in my lifetime that Fabrizio would get straightened out. But I went away, and when I went away, Fabrizio was taking orders from me and Paulie G. When I come home, Fabrizio straight out. But that's how quick, you know what I mean? You go from a low to a high. Yeah. 
Well, that's one thing I wanted to get into because I really do want to talk about each individual member and have you fill us in kind of on what their role is. Like we always hear about, you know, in these crews and in, in, in families, whether it's soldiers, associates, everybody has a role, whether they were an earner or they did the work and they were the guys that were, were violent. So I'd like to actually start with Fabrizio. And I have one picture here. Um, I mean, I have a couple of pictures that he's in. But, you know, in case anybody doesn't know, this is him with Tommy Reynolds. Yes. Um, I think they were in Raybrook at the time. Is that right? Uh, I'm not sure if that's Raybrook. That might be MDC. Uh, that was pre-trial because I'm sure they got split up when they got sentenced. So I don't think it's Raybrook. It's probably MDC. Oh, okay. In Brooklyn. Right. So, and obviously Fabrizio is the taller one for anybody that doesn't know. Yeah. Um, so what was his role? Was that really what it was? I mean, he just took errands and he was kind of a, was he an earner or, or what can you tell us about Fabrizio, it? Well, Fabrizio at the time, uh, Fabrizio was always a tough kid. He was a tough kid. He had a nice punch. If you hit him, he would knock you the fuck out. I yeah. mean, Fabrizio was always a tough kid. Uh, he's full-blooded Italian. Uh, he was always a good kid. He comes from a good family. His mother was Mario and Tina. He has two other, two older brothers. We grew up in the same building together. And, uh, you know, we all came from good families. It's just that the street, you know, in the street, after a while, the street can brainwash you. Yeah. You know, you look up to certain people and say, wow, you know what? I want to be, uh, you know, like these guys. But uh, Fabrizio was always a good kid. He liked to smoke weed. He smoked, always smoked weed, Fabrizio. Yeah. And uh, every so often, I guess he would take a pill, like maybe a Xanax or something. But, uh, you know, Fabrizio was a good kid. You know, that's, uh, he would go on missions with me and Tommy Reynolds. We would shake down drug dealers. We would grab their beepers. And the next day, if those drug dealers were with anybody, they would have to come to Bay 23rd. And uh, if they were with somebody, uh, Joe Benanti would speak up for us. You know, if not, Tommy Karate was there. And, uh, you know, stuff like that. You know, and if, you know, if they weren't with nobody, then we, they were with us now. They would have to pay us to sell drugs. Yeah. But you, would you say that Fabrizio was one of the, the less dangerous guys? Yes. Fabrizio was definitely one of the less dangerous guys. Yes. But Fabrizio, when I went away, I heard some stories about him. Uh, when I used to call Tommy Reynolds when I was in McKean, uh, Tommy Reynolds told me over the phone, he said, Jimmy, he said, Fabrizio is one of us now. So when he told me that, I know Fabrizio is now involved in a murder. When yeah. he said that, Fabrizio is one of us now. So he's telling me, you know, Fabrizio was involved in something. So... You know, I never did anything with Fabrizio. I never committed a murder with Fabrizio. You know, so, you know, my testimony with Fabrizio was minimal. It was just street stuff. If I if they used me on Fabrizio, which he took a plea, you know, so uh, it, the guy who would hurt Fabrizio would be Joey Calco because uh, Fabrizio was there when Joey Calco killed that 19-year-old kid. And that's what they were talking about when they said he's one of us now, right? That's the only murder he was. Yes, probably, yes. Okay. All right. Um, I want to move on to uh, Tommy Reynolds. They called him TK. Is that correct? They called him TK, yes. Uh, now, I've always heard he was one of the tougher guys. And we know he was one of the more violent. Uh, there's a story about him uh, sticking a fork in somebody's eye. Can you tell us about that? Well, yeah. Tom, Tommy was like that. Well, look, as far as tough with his hands, he wasn't tough with his hands. He was a ballsy kid, 100% ballsy. Uh, he was he was rootless. He'll kill you in a minute. Uh, you know, me and Reynolds, what happened was we, I was involved with Tommy with a double homicide. And Joey Kalko was there. And my friend Willie was there. Willie wasn't supposed to be there. What happened was after little Georgia Adama was murdered, we found out that the kid Neil Nastro 
was in the car with Fat Stevie when Fat Stevie killed little Georgie Adamo. So we went hunting for Fat Stevie. We couldn't find Fat Stevie. Fat Stevie was in New York City hiding out in somewhere with his family or something. You know, he had an apartment out there. We would look for him. We never found him. So eventually, Paulie G tells us, he says, you know what? We can't find Fat Stevie. We're going to kill one of his friends. He killed one of ours. We're going to kill one of his. And that night, we end up beeping this kid Neil. They had the beepers at the time. And instead of him calling back the payphone, he comes directly to the payphone. So when he comes to the payphone, I just basically like cut him off. And Tommy Reynolds gets out and he kills him and his uncle. Just like that. Just like that. That's how fast it was. It was quick. And what was the aftermath of that? I know that you got called to somebody's house after that. The aftermath of that was I took off. As I took off, there was this guy that was walking down the street. Now, you know, when you see someone speeding, usually you say, well, you know what? You run across the street. So this guy was taking his time. He thought I was going to slow down. I end up running him over. He went flying up in the air. The kid Willie's in the car. He's a funny kid, my friend Willie. He goes like this. He goes, holy shit. I feel like Action Jackson. <laughs> and everyone started laughing. So I go towards Staten Island. I pull over on the Verrazano Bridge. Tommy Reynolds gets out, throws the gun over the bridge into the water. I drop Tommy Reynolds and Joey Kalko off in Staten Island. And then I go see Paulie G. At this time, there was also a guy by the name of Frankie Mericanda that was just murdered. This was Georgie Conti's good friend. And he was around Georgie the Chico. He used to snort a lot of coke and he would be in the bar. Eventually he wanted to get straightened out, but Bobby the Chico used to tell me all the time he's never gonna get straightened out because he does too much drugs. So Frankie Mericanda was killed by another wise guy by the name of Frankie Bones, Frankie Sharp. But at this time, nobody knew who killed Frankie Mericanda. So all these murders are happening. So at this time, after this happens, our names are going around as being a suspect in Frankie Mericanda's murder and all these other murders that's going on. So one day, a guy by the name of Charlie Tuna calls me up and he says, Jimmy, he says, uh, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, Charlie, sure. I said, you know, whenever you want to talk to me, he said, yeah, could you come to my house uh, so-and-so time? I said, yeah, sure. So after he calls me, I call Tommy Reynolds. I said, Tommy, I said, this guy, Charlie Tuna, this is when the flip-flops just came out. Okay, me and Paulie G were the first ones to have a flip-flop. And I go, Tommy, I said, this guy, Charlie Tuna, just called me. He wants me to go by his house. He wants to talk to me. So Tommy Reynolds goes like this. He says, Jimmy, Jimmy, don't go. Don't go. He's, he's, uh, he's afraid of that little guy, meaning Georgie Conti. Yeah. He says, call Paulie. Make Paulie go with you. I said, okay. He said, I said, okay, I'm going to call Paulie. He said, don't go. Whatever you do, don't go. So I call Paulie G and I tell Paulie what's going on. I said, Paul, I said, this guy, Charlie Tuna just called me. He wants me to go by his house. He has to talk to me about something. He says, Jimmy, you want me to come with you? I said, no. I said, I just want you to know where I'm going. I said, I got my pistol on me. You know, I always had a pistol. After John Paulie was murdered, we always had pistols on us. Every day. We always had a gun. So I go by Charlie Tuna's house. I got my 380 on me. At this time, I had a Corvette. I double park in front of his car, in front of his house, and I keep it started. Okay, because I know something's up. So I walk up maybe three flights of stairs, and there's a screen door where I look in the screen door, and Charlie Tuna is sitting on his sofa. Now, when you 
have someone come into the house, don't you usually greet them and open up the door and say, hey, Jimmy, come in. Absolutely. So he's sitting on the sofa and he goes, hey, Jimmy, come in. So as I open up the door, you know, I've been to Charlie's house before because I know him since I was a kid. Now, you could go upstairs to the bedrooms and there's this divider of a wall where you go upstairs. Now, as I open up the door, I hear a creak of wood. You ever see a wooden floor? You step on a wooden floor and you hear like the creak? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I hear a creak and I jet straight to my Corvette. I get in my Corvette and I go straight to Bay 23rd and Bed. When I get to Bay 23rd and Bed, Joe Benanti's there standing on the corner with Paulie Galino. I get out of the car and I tell Joe Benanti and Paulie Galino, this guy Charlie Tuna just tried to set me up. So Joe Benanti's telling me, Jimmy, calm down, calm down. I said, Joe, this guy tried to set me up. I'm telling you. This guy just tried to set me up, and I'm telling Paulie. And Paulie believes me because Paulie knows. I'm saying, Paulie, this guy fucking tried to set me up. I'm telling you, look, they tried to kill me, these motherfuckers. So who shows up on Bay 23rd and Bed within five minutes later? Georgie Conti. Okay? He shows up, and he says, Jimmy, can I talk to you? So I go like this. I go near his window. I said, first I go, look, Joe. I said, look, Paulie, look who's here. I said, I'm telling you, they try to set me up. So I tell Georgie Conte, I said, Georgie, were you just in the house at Charlie Tuna's house? Did you just try to kill me? You just try to set me up? Because, see, I knew what these guys were about. You know, I knew that they were sneaky and they were manipulative. So I knew who they were. And I always knew who the killers were. And I always knew who the killers weren't. You know, it was very yeah. important to know who the killers were in my neighborhood. So he swears up and down, Jimmy, what are you talking about? I know you since you were a kid. You think I would do that to you? And I said, Georgie. I said, Charlie just tried to set me up. Now, I wasn't going to keep on accusing Georgie that he was going to, that, you know, he set me up to kill me because he was a captain with the Lucchese family. So I knew right there and then, you know what? Okay, now I got to play this off and just say, Charlie, try to set me up. Because I asked him, I said, were you in the house? And he said, no. But I guarantee you 100%, if I walk into that house, I'm disappearing, never to be seen again. Because at that time, there was a lot of murders going on. So I tell Paulie G, Georgie Conti tells me, he says, Jimmy, tell Tommy Reynolds and Calco to stay out of the neighborhood. So I tell Paulie G, I said, Paulie, Georgie's telling me to tell Tommy Reynolds and Calco to stay out of the neighborhood. So Paulie G comes over. He said, Georgie, what's up? He says, uh, he says, Paul, he says, uh, yeah, you know, just tell Tommy and Joey to stay out of the neighborhood. I said, why? What happened? Paul G tells him what happened. And, he, you know, he tells him uh, about Neil Nashville and the uncle. And Paul E.G. just tells him like this. He said, he said, Georgie, he said, you killed one of ours, meaning John Polio. We killed two of yours. Now we're even. And Joe Benanti is just looking at Paul E.G. like he's crazy. You know, but that's how, but that's how Paul E.G. was. You know, yeah. and, uh, you know, Joe Benanti, too, he was an old time wise guy. They used to call him Bullethead. He did like 23 years in jail. He was always broke. And we put him in action, you know, as far as uh, money wise. He never made no money. Once he was once we were with him, we started he started making money. He loved to gamble and he always had money in his pocket, you know. Yeah. But that's that story. All right. Um. The next one I want to ask you about, uh, obviously, and the only picture I have of him alone is a, a picture of him when he's older, but Joey Calco. Joey Calco. Joey Calco was from Bay 14th and Bath Avenue. We went to school together. Joey was always a tough kid. He was a wild kid, dangerous kid. This kid went to court with a gun. When he went to court, he actually buried the gun before going into the courthouse. When he came out, he went back to get the gun, and a bunch of cops rushed him and charged him and arrested him for a gun. That's how stupid he was. 
you know, but he was a tough kid in the neighborhood, always fighting with people. He would fight with us. We weren't too friendly with him in the beginning. I started getting friendly with him after his brother Charlie was murdered. And uh, that's when he started sleeping over my house and uh, we started becoming tight. But when I was with Bobby the Chico and Michael Hamster, you know, I was with Bobby the Chico first and then Michael Hamster comes out of nowhere. He was originally like from around Bay 50th and he came around out of nowhere and started hanging out with Bobby the Chico. He started coming to Georgie Chico's club. Now we were friendly for a little while and Georgie the Chico would give me the keys to his club where I would have card games at nighttime. I would make my friends come in there and other kids and we could play cards and gamble. We played gin rummy, you could play blackjack. You know, we had like a little casino in there. You know, sometimes Mikey Scars would come in, another wise guy would come in, they would see that the place, the lights were on, they would walk in, and we all be playing cards for money, you know. And then at the end of the night, I make sure the place was nice and clean. And uh, you know, Georgie never wanted any money from me, Georgie the Chico or Bobby the Chico. They just wanted me to earn. And it's like we had our own little crew. But then Michael Hamster started not to like my friends. Yeah. This is where the beef started. So when he started not like my friends, he ended up, you know, little Georgia Adamo got hooked on drugs. And then he ended up, little Georgia Adamo was walking down Bay 14th Street at Joey Capo's house. And Michael Hamster ends up jumping him. And he gives little Georgia Adamo a concussion. So that was the start of not liking Michael Hampston anymore. Yeah. And I wanted to, before I forget, ask, because this is something that, you know, I asked you ahead of time if we could speak about. But um, Charlie Calco, a lot of us have, have heard or read that, you know, Joey Calco had a brother. And I believe he even told the judge at one point during sentencing, you know, that he had lost a brother to this life. Not a lot of people, though, really know about Charlie Calco. Can you tell us about his murder? Charlie Calco was a really good kid. I say a good kid because I'm from the street. So when I say a good kid, meaning he was a tough kid and he was a polite kid. He was always polite, respectful. Now, in my neighborhood, we were always robbing cars, breaking windows, stealing uh, if you had an arcade, we were robbing all the quarters in the machines. Yeah. You know, that's how we were doing it when we were kids. Charlie Calco, what he did was you had this guy, Louis Tuzio. Louis Tuzio was the guy who eventually killed Gus Faraci, the guy who killed the DEA agent. Gus Faraci killed the DEA agent. Later on, Louis Tuzio meets him. Louis Tuzio kills him, and, and he ends up shooting Joey Scafani that was in the car with Gus Faraci. Now, Louis Tuzio was not straightened out. He was from 18th Avenue and 81st Street. He was a tough kid in the neighborhood. His name was going around. He had a brother, Nicky. And Charlie Calco ends up robbing a stolen car that belonged to Louis Tuzio. Louis Tuzio had this car parked for a reason. He was going to use it to do something with it. I don't know what he was going to do with it. Maybe he's going to murder somebody with it. Maybe he's going to do a stick-up with it. Don't know. Charlie Calco ends up stealing Louis Tuzio's car. <clears throat> what happens next is Charlie Calco gets found on Bay 14th between 86th Street and Benson Avenue up the block from Joey Calco's house in an apartment hung in the basement okay this is uh you know joey saw this and i'm sure you know joey definitely has ptsd from it but uh you know it was a setup murder louis tuzio hung him and made it look like a suicide you know this is all documented in records from nikki tuzio because he came forward too so he told them you know the story of that what happened so that's how we know about that did joey ever take uh any kind of did he ever was there any retaliation against anybody for that murder 
No, because at the time we didn't know. We thought it was just a suicide. But Joey always had it back of his head. He said, my brother didn't kill himself. I know my brother too well. You know, and then when this indictment went down and all these people cooperated, that's when all this information came out. Nicky yeah. Tuzio came forward. And when he came forward, he told the truth that Louis Tuzio is the one who killed Charlie uh, Calco. Wow. So with that, um, we're basically down to um, you as far as the five main members. And I wanted to you know, ask you some stuff like, for instance, um, your big thing was robbing banks. I used to rob. I used to steal. <clears throat> yeah, and I wanted to ask you how you got into that and who uh, got you started into doing the bank jobs. Well, I started robbing banks with a kid by the name of Gerard Bellafury. I was introduced to Gerard Bellafury from my friend William Galloway. William Galloway was dating some girl in my building. That's how I met him. And then he started becoming friendly with little Georgie. Now, little Georgie used to love to smoke cigarettes at an early age and smoke a lot of pot. When we were kids, we used to smoke a lot of pot. You know, just smoke pot. It was, you know, it was good smoking pot. You were a kid, you were a teenager. It's what the kids do. You know, it's what they do today. But William Galloway introduces me to the kid Gerard Bellafiori. He says, Jimmy, you want to come rob a bank? Rob a bank. What do you mean rob a bank? You know, he says, no, we'll take a night deposit off a wall. And I, and I said, I said, okay. I said, you know, let's do it. So my first bank, we took down $80,000. It was me. William Galloway and some kid George uh, from uh, from Bay Ridge. It was like over eighty thousand dollars. I got twenty thousand quick cash, and I said, you know what? This is fucking great. I said, let's do this again next week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, <laughs> hell yeah, I would have done the same thing. Fucking man. awesome, right? We got to do this again next weekend. <laughs> so on a Sunday yeah, night, I'm so on a Sunday night. You know, that's when everybody deposits their money. All the businesses deposit their money in the night deposit box, and they got all these canvas bags. So, Gerard, then you got four screws on each side of the night deposit box. What you do is you pop open with screw screwdriver the tins. You got two pieces of tin. You pop them open, and then you got two uh, bolts. You got four bolts. You take those four bolts off. Once you take those four bolts off, you got two crowbars. One guy goes on each side, and you take the thing right off, it pops off. Then later on, we got the Jaws of Life, an electric device where you just stick it in there, and it pops right off. It goes, you just press the button, it goes boom, 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 and it pops right off the wall, pop. And then you look in, and you see all these canvas bags. They're like maybe four feet down. And you get a stick, and what you do is you put a fish, fish hook on the bottom of the stick, like a, a broomstick, and you go fishing, and you grab the canvas bags, and it comes up with the canvas bags. You take it off, boom. Grab another one, take it off, boom. Grab another one, take it off. And by the time you know it, you just keep on making money. <laughs> That's it. unbelievable. I wish I would have known about that when I was younger, <laughs> Jimmy. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to show some... Um, pictures here of some of the bath avenue guys um oh first uh i didn't want to skip this this i believe is this is that's, yeah that's uh me when i was a kid that's Sherrod with the little mustache on his face yeah. and uh william galloway galloway with the uh, sunglasses this is when we were robbing banks and that's one of my suits a green suit that i used to rob the banks with because it was dark at night and i used to like you know I try to blend in. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Um, and and that's an old picture. Well, that's a long, long time ago. Yeah, well, you can tell you're young. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Willie, Willie Gallo, Willie Galloway was called Applehead. Is that correct? He was called Applehead. And right now, Willie is away. He ended up yeah. catching a he ended up catching a beef for something he did, something stupidity. But I spoke to him a couple of days ago. And he has a lot of stories. Uh, he actually drove Fabrizio to go get strained out. But he's going to be home soon. So as soon as he comes home, he'll be on this platform 
talking to you guys about his stories, about when he came home and everything that he knows. So believe me, he's a funny guy. You're going to laugh at him, but he has a lot of stories. And it's one story where, you know, he got arrested for the gun charge when he threw the shots in the air in front of the diner. And he did nine months for that. Now, as he's doing the nine months, I got picked up for a bank robbery. So I haven't seen Willie for a very long time. And, uh, but he was telling me, he says, Jimmy, so when I see, I seen Willie in 98, when I came home, November 98, and Willie tells me, he says, Jimmy, he says, you know, he says, I didn't know these guys killed Paulie. He says, when they first picked me up, when I got home, you know, I was in, you know, their, their truck, they picked me up with a, 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 a Ford truck. And I said, I said, yo, I said, what, what happened to Paulie? You know, what the fuck happened to Paulie? And, and uh, all of them look at each other and they tell Willie, Willie, don't ever mention Paulie again. You know, I mean, that's how stupid Willie was. I mean, he really didn't know much about this life. Yeah. You know, he should never mention Paulie. You know, meanwhile, he said, what happened to Paulie? Meanwhile, everybody in the car that he's talking to, it was involved in killing him. You know, so it's fucking crazy. Yeah, it is. I just want to take a second here to point out, because um, I know you've had these numbers before, but I haven't. We have 640 people watching live right now. Good, nice. Yeah, and I just want to, I'm sorry. I want, hey guys. Yeah, and I just want to say, uh, for any of you that are not my subscribers, uh, please subscribe, hit the like button, because I'm hoping today uh, to hit 3,000 subs. So uh, if some of you aren't already subscribed, please go ahead and do that. I would appreciate it a lot. Uh, guys, uh, yeah, guys, if uh, if you can subscribe to the Fat Ball Sicilian. I mean, he's a decent guy in my eyes, and uh, hopefully he don't turn out to be a Lee Cole. Yeah, you, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I, know that. <laughs> I know that. Don't worry. Yeah, I'll always uh, stay true to, uh, to who I am and everything I've said. You got um, to take a stand, you know? You got to be your own guy. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to pull up just a couple of pictures. This one, we, we know everybody uh, that's in this picture. Uh, you can tell us, though. If you like. Yes, that's uh, Joey Calco. That's me with my arm around Paulie G. Uh, Paulie G, of, of course, uh, Tommy Reynolds and Fabrizio DiFranziski. Okay. Um, so we know those were the main five. Uh, yes. This picture I've always wondered about because, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen this one. If you can tell us about some of the other guys and if they were really members or if they had any real role in the crew or if they were just hangarounds. Uh, in this photo, I can tell you that two of these people are dead. One of them just overdosed maybe two, three months ago. Uh, <clears throat> you see William Galloway's in the back near Tommy Reynolds. Uh, right behind Paulie G is William Galloway hiding his face. Paulie yeah. G has his arm around Albert Slavin. Behind Albert, behind Albert Slavin is... Carlo De Giacomo, he's actually the kid's house that I ran to with the bank robbery, and uh, that's the time I got pinched. Uh, next to Albert Slavin is a kid by the name of Mario Russo. He uh, was from my neighborhood. Every so often he would hang out with us, but he was uh, basically solo, hanging out with, uh, you know, he had friends all over the place. I'm behind Mario Russo. Next to Mario Russo is Joey Calco. Behind Joey Calco is Dean Benicillo. Eight is enough. He flipped in eight minutes. Next to Dean Benicillo is Fabrizio DiFranziski. And next to Joey Calco is the kid Johnny Smash. He just passed away uh, a couple months ago. Rest his soul. Okay, it's good to know that because I always wondered about everybody that was in that picture. Yes. Um, so the other two guys, uh, somebody there, th everybody asks about them. I see it in my comments. People have written me. They want me to ask you about Mikey Amin and Anthony Gonzo Gonzalez. What can you tell us about those two? Michael Yamin and Anthony Gonzalez were very tight with Paulie G. 
Uh, they were basically Paulie Jean's goons. I mean, they were both nice kids. They were the type of kids, if Paulie G told them to do something, uh, they did it. They ran some errands for Paulie G. They uh, sold maybe some cocaine for Paulie. You know, Paulie G made them make some money. But, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, they weren't bad kids. You know, they were – the kid Mike and Mean was a little botch. The kid Anthony Gonzalez was a little smaller, smarter than Mikey and Mean. But uh, Paulie G really uh, liked them. And, uh, you know, he wanted them to get a number, you know. When we got the numbers on our legs, the first ones to go was me, Tommy Reynolds, and Paulie Galino. We went to 18th Avenue and 81st Street. Some guy, Mike, did the, the tattoos in a building. I got, uh, Paulie G got a number one. I got number two. And Reynolds was number three. And I'll tell you, after that, I really, really didn't know. I know they got numbers, but I didn't keep up with who was who. You know, so who was four, who was five, who was six, who was seven. But I know Joey Calco was number seven. Okay, he didn't want to get the tattoo, right? You know what? It was just something where, you know, Paulie G wanted us to get numbers. And we were just like, okay, let's get numbers. I mean, you know what it is? Look, when you're a kid, okay, you really don't think right. You know, I mean, you don't even know who you are. I didn't find out who I was till maybe I was about 30-something years old. You know, I just knew that, you know, I didn't want to destroy my life, you know. And unfortunately, things I did in the past, it came back to haunt me. As soon as the feds picked me up at my house, they charged in, they charged in the door, about 30 of them. They raided my fucking house. They took me out and they said, your past came back to haunt you, just like that. And I knew eventually I was going to get picked up. It was just a matter of time. Yeah. Um. Next, I, I, I wanted to talk about, because I, there's something I'm leading up to, but um, the murder of Vincent Bickleman. Vincent Bickleman was a burglary guy that really did a lot of burglaries in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, he robbed the wrong house one night. He robbed Anthony Sparrow, daughter, Jill's house on 17th Avenue and Cropsey near 17th Avenue Park. <clears throat> what he did was he stole a piece of jewelry. The jewelry had Jill on it, J-I-L-L. -L. He went to a jewelry store in the local neighborhood, and the guy in the neighborhood saw the piece, and he recognized it. And he probably asked the kid, where'd you get this? He, the kid probably had a show ID. And, uh, you know, we, Sparrow found out who the kid was. We got the order to look for this kid. We kept on looking for him, scouting the neighborhood. Eventually, Paulie G is driving around with Albert Slavin and Joey Milano down 19th Avenue. They're smoking a joint. Paulie G looks. He says, oh, shit, there's Vincent Bickleman. He tells the kid Albert Slavin to pull over. And he tells Albert, keep on going. He says, don't stop. Keep on going. And uh, he jumps out of the car. And uh, he runs up to the kid, Vincent Bickleman, shoots him five times, and kills him right off the corner of 19th Avenue and Bet. Right on the corner from 19th Avenue and Bet is the 6-2 precinct. So, you know, that's how ballsy Paulie Galino was. After he kills him, he gets in touch with me, Nitty Greg's in. He walks right to Nitty Greg's in, and he tells me what happened, and he says, Jimmy, he says, I just did this with the kid Albert Slavin was in the car. He says, I'm letting Sparrow know that you were with me because I want you to get recognition for this too. So the next day, we went to Joe Benanti and Sparrow. We told him, yeah, we took care of that thing. Paulie G said, Jimmy was with me, and I got the credit for that too. If you go to uh, Mob Over Miami, the original book, they got me shooting the kid Vincent Bickleman because that was the in information that the kid Mikey Amini gave them when Mikey Amini first came forward, that I was at the Vincent Bickleman murder, which I wasn't at the Vincent, B Vincent Bickleman murder. Yeah. And I it's only, funny when you... I only, I only took credit for it because in the street, you know, you get credit for it this way later on in life. You know what? 
you know, you you get straightened out that way. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, something funny that I caught when you said about the kid Joey Milano in the car. Isn't Joseph Milano the name that uh, Joey Calco wound up taking? In it's really funny because we had, a, we had a kid in our neighborhood named Joey Milano, and Joey Calco ends up stealing his name. Yeah, that's in the, that's, in, in the witness protection program. He stole his name, and we always made a joke out of that. You know what I mean, he's a me. He stole Joey Milano's name. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that he would do that. I, I didn't think about it until you just said about him being in the car. But, you can't make uh, this shit up. No, you really can't. It's insane. Yeah. So, um, all right. So now we know about the the Bickelman murder. Um, the next thing I want to move on to. And this is obviously a very important part of your story and the story of the Bath Avenue crew. Um, the night of February 18th, 1993. Yes, that that night, <clears throat> it was actually my ex-girlfriend's birthday. Some girl I'd been with for about 19 years. And I get a call from Chris Passiello. He says he has this score with some guy that owns... X-rated video stores and that there should be maybe close to a million dollars in cash. So he tells me half a million, a million. So that grabbed my attention. I called Tommy Reynolds because I did scores with Tommy Reynolds and I did scores with Chris Paciello before I did the Stan Allen Mall bank with him. That was very successful. We got close to half a million dollars with that. And, uh, so we figured, you know what, right, okay, this this should be nothing too. Uh, I called Paulie G. I said, Paulie, I'm going to go do this uh, score. Chris has a score to do in Staten Island. Can I borrow the kid Michael Yamini? Now, I never really did anything with the kid Michael Yamini. I did one other thing with him, uh, and, you know, it wasn't successful. But uh, So I asked Paulie G for Mikey Yamini. So I scoop up Mikey Yamini. I grabbed Tommy Reynolds and I head down to Staten Island to Chris Paciello's house. I go to Chris Paciello's house. I walk in his apartment. When I walk into his apartment, Chris is, he has a video of some girl that uh, he was having sex with, you know, and I'm, and I was just watching it and just, you know, with kids and I just thought, wow, you know, it was some neighborhood girl, which I'm not going to say who she is, but, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in that, but I'm not going to say who she is. And then from there, Chris drives the car to the destination of where the safe was. When we get there, me, Tommy Reynolds, and Michael Yamini get out. I got a baseball cap on with a pair of regular glasses. We have a little disguise. Uh, I knock on the door. Now, Chris is explaining to me that there's a guy in the house, okay? Yeah. So there was never supposed to be anybody else in this house, okay? So wherever he got his information, obviously he knew the people. When the woman answered the door, I was really surprised, you know, because I just looked. They said, wow, this, you know, no, a guy's supposed to be here. There ain't supposed to be a woman here, you know? And, you know, this is the only, you know, this is, you know, I wasn't a home invasion guy, you know? I did one other thing with the kid, William Galloway. I stuck up some kid one time in his house and I wasn't, you know, this was not my gig to do things like this, you know? So when mm -hmm. I saw this woman, I was like startled. I said, you know, she ain't supposed to be here. And then all of a sudden she opens up the door and, Tommy Reynolds has his gun out. Now, there's three people at the door. Mike Yamin's at the door. I'm at the door. And the kid Tommy Reynolds at the door. Tommy Reynolds has his gun out. He's pointing the gun. And all of a sudden, I see this woman goes flying across the room. Now, we never got in no door. Okay? As soon as... The lady got shot. I just scattered, and they followed me to the car where Chris was. Now, 
when we got in the car with Chris, Chris was like, what happened? What happened? And I was like, Chris, just get out of here. Get the fuck out of here. And Tommy Reynolds goes, he says, Jimmy, I'm going to hell for this. And I was like, Tommy, I said, what the fuck happened? How, how the fuck you do that? What the fuck happened? You know, so everybody was startled in the car. And we we end up going to Chris's house. I drop him off. I head back to Brooklyn. I stopped in the, Mer- the middle of the Verrazano. Tommy Reynolds throws the gun over the Verrazano Bridge. And I go see Paulie G. I drop Reynolds off. And the kid Mike and Meanie, I go see Paulie G. I tell Paulie G what happened. And Paulie G just goes, he said, he said, he said, what the fuck did Tommy do? How the fuck did he do this? You know? And you know, that's what happened. And uh a couple of days go by. I drive down to Staten Island with Paulie Galino, and I meet Chris Passiello with the kid Lee Devanzo in front of the Victory Inn. Now it's the Ramada. It's the Victory Inn now. Now, when I'm driving down to the Staten Island, Paulie G's intention is to kill the kid Chris. You know, I don't know the kid Chris is going to show up with Lee. You know, I was a little friendly with Lee. I used to go to the nightclubs with, with Lee. Lee was a tough kid. And uh, I always liked Lee. I always got along with Lee. And uh, so we meet in front of the Victory Inn. Paulie G pulls up. Chris pulls up. Paulie G's talking about, he says, Jimmy, let's just kill him right now. And I go like this. I said, Paulie. I said, you know what, let me just talk to him. He said, Jimmy, he says, I'm telling you, let me, let me, let's just kill him. You know, I said, Paulie, I think I could talk to him. You know, I, you know, I don't think we have to kill him. He says, all right. He says, Jimmy, if that's what you want to do, I'm going to respect what you want to do. I'm telling you, we should kill him, you know. And uh, so that night I saved the kid Chris's life. And uh, <clears throat> I have a conversation with Chris. I said, Chris, after tonight, we never speak about this again. Anyone who talks about this is a rat. And uh, that's actually the last time I saw Chris. And I want to bring up a couple of pictures just so people know if they don't know what Chris Pacello looks like. This is obviously a mug shot. And uh, this is him later in life after he became a, a big success in Miami. Um, so that was his connection to your crew, right? Chris Pacello was Chris, a guy you did scores with. Chris, Chris was never a part of the Bad Day Avenue crew. He was a Staten Island kid. He was a New Springsville boy him and his friends, and that was his connection. I did some scores with him. Uh, you know, I helped him out. One of his friends needed a, a gun at one time. His friend was a drug dealer on Staten Island. This is all on record because when I came forward, I put everything on the table. I had to sit down with a prosecutor, and I told the prosecutor, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie for you. This is everything I did in my life. I even told them about the pack of bubble gum I stole when I was a kid, you know, just to make sure, you know, I had everything. I was done with it. So, you know, but uh, Chris was not a part of the Bad Day Avenue crew. And, uh, you know, Chris did not also sign up for, you know, that night. You know, we had no intention of ever hurting a woman. That uh, affects me to this day. I'm sure it bothers him, too. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, Tommy Reynolds is doing 50 years for that. We all cooperated, me, Chris, and the kid Mike Yamini. I got eight years for that. Chris Paseo got eight years for that. And, uh, you know, we have to live with this, and this will always be brought up and uh, be a part of that terrible day. And I feel sorry for what I've done in my life. and. I'm sorry to the family for that, and it really hurts me to this day. Yeah, we can we can always see the emotion in your face when you tell that story. Um, the next big event was the murder of Paulie Galino. 
you've already kind of touched on it. And I think a lot of people know that story. It's up to you if you want to go over it again. At this time, that incident happened February 18th. Two months go by. Uh, May 10th, I end up doing another bank robbery. Uh, I end up getting caught for a bank robbery. They picked me up on May 10th. As I'm in jail, Paulie G, I'm calling Paulie G. He's going to my mother's house. And uh, he bought me a nice chain with a Christ head on it that I did my whole time, my whole bid with. And uh, he ends up getting killed July 26th, two months after I got picked up. And he's telling me over the phone, uh, you know, I... He actually tell my mother because he always goes to my mother's house and gives my mother money for me to put in my commissary. And he's telling my mother, Maddie, please pray for me. And, uh, you know, so we knew something was up. And, uh, you know, when, when Paulie G gets killed, uh, I make the phone call to my house and my mother's telling me, Jimmy, they killed Paulie G last night. And, uh, you know, I end up calling Tommy Reynolds, and Tommy Reynolds answers the phone, and I go like this. I said, I said, Reynolds, was it you? Did you do it? Was it you? And he starts crying. He says, you know, no, it wasn't me, you know, stuff like that. But it was a very emotional time. Uh, you know, my family ends up going to his wake, and uh, none of his friends are there as far as the Bad Avenue crew. So we knew right off the bat what went on. And, uh, you know, it was a, a, a terrible thing. Yeah, it's a very sad story. Um, the only other thing um, I want to talk about is because this is something that really bothers me because I've read, you know, um, some stuff that his father, the kid's father said and stuff about his son um, being killed. But the murder of uh, Jack Sharon, the 19 year old kid that Joey, Joey Calco killed. Jack Sharon was a young kid. He didn't know what he was getting involved in. Uh, me, I was away at the time. I have nothing to do with that murder. Uh, it was Fabrizio, Tommy Reynolds, and Joey Calco. This kid was selling drugs in the neighborhood. And, you know, I don't think Joey Calco had to kill the kid. Uh, what happened was when Joey Calco killed the kid, because Joey Calco told me this story out of his mouth when I was talking to him, uh, he got out of the car. He ends up killing the kid, and Joey, uh, Tommy Reynolds, and Fabrizio ends up taking off, leaving Joey Calco there at the scene where Joey Calco has to run like four blocks to get out of there. And uh, But that's another senseless murder. The kid was only 19 years old. Uh, you know, he didn't know who he was involved with. And, uh, you know, me personally... You know, if he was dealing with me, he would have never got killed because, uh, you know, it was just senseless killing that kid 19 years old. So that's Joey Calco. He had the first person he killed was Paulie Galino and the second person, which was his best friend. And uh, the second was a 19 year old kid who didn't need to be. Yes. The first person Joey Calco ever killed was one of his friends, Paulie Galino. That's a hundred percent. The second person he killed was a 19 year old kid. So these guys in the neighborhood, this is what they do to make a rep for themselves. And, uh, you know, unfortunately a lot of people, family pay the price and they're the ones that cry at the end because that life is just a dead end. Yeah, it is. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about, really, uh, just so everybody can, you know, kind of put an ending to the story. I'm trying to just paint a whole picture here. Um, the trial it was said I've heard from several people uh, that that were you know there firsthand that the trial was a very emotional. Uh, well, what trial are you talking about? Well, I mean, the ending, basically, when everything uh, with, with Spiro and with yeah, Tommy Reynolds. Well, 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 what's here? Well, 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 for Brizio and Tommy Reynolds, they took pleas. So the only trial that was was Anthony Spiro. Anthony yeah. Spiro was the only one who went to trial. So, you know, when I testified against Anthony Spiro, I'm going to be very honest with you because I'm an honest guy. Uh, I looked right in his face and I just did my testimony 
And basically, all these guys I haven't seen in so long, meaning Joey Calco. Uh, there was some other kid, Mike DeRosa, that testified on his trial. Uh, and a few other people, Al Diaco, testified on his trial. I'm sure they, they brought in some big wigs too, you know. So anything I said was corroborated to Joey Calco. And I wasn't involved in the Paulie Galino murder. So Joey Calco was definitely the main guy to testify against Sparrow because I wasn't around for Paulie Galino. You know, I just testified about the Vincent Bickerman murder, that Paulie G, that Paulie G killed Vincent Bickerman because he robbed Anthony Sparrow's daughter's house. So, you know, my testimony was basically that. You know, it wasn't nothing compared to Joey Calco's where he got an order from Sparrow to kill Paulie Galino. Yeah. Maybe it was the sentencing of Tommy and Fabrizio that, that they said. That was, was, that, that was emotional. Uh, the sentencing of Tommy Fabrizio. Uh, you know, look, unfortunately, Fabrizio copped out to 35 years. Tommy Reynolds copped out to 50. And, uh, you know, the victim's families were there. So, you know, everyone is emotional. It's a sad thing. Nothing good comes out of this, whether you're going to jail, whether someone passed away. Uh, you know, everyone is hurt. Uh, you know, the person going to jail, their family's hurt. The person, the victim, their family's there. So there's nothing good that comes out of it. It's all uh, sadness at the end of the day. There ain't no happiness you know, that's why I always say there ain't no happy endings in this life. Yeah. And your decision to cooperate, uh, just if you could tell us quickly about that. My decision to cooperate was basically, I just finished doing close to six years in prison. I'm out in the street 11 months. I kept my mouth shut all the time I was in jail. I never said nothing. All of a sudden, guys are rolling on me and my family are telling me, Jimmy, is this true about the woman? I held this in for a long time. It always bothered me. And I, you know, I told my family, I said, yeah, you know, it is true. I'm ashamed of it to be involved in something like this. And, uh, you know, my family just said, Jimmy, you know what? Forget about this life. This life is over. Save yourself. Maybe someday we'll sit down at a table with you again. And, uh, you know, I paid the price. My father had cancer at the time. I lost him while I was away. I lost my grandmother while I was away. Paulie G was murdered while I was away. So I've been through my own little trial and tribulations in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to do good now. Yeah. And I just want to make it clear to everybody, because some people like to, you know, talk like as if, um, like some of you went without being punished. Everybody in that case wound up doing time, even the cooperators, right? Absolutely. Nobody got off. Nobody got off anything with a slap on the wrist. Uh, my first bid, I did close to six. I got eight years for that, for my cooperation. Eight years I got just for cooperation. And I'm fine. With, and I'm fine with that. And, you know, I just want to I try to put it behind me every day. But of course, it's never going to be behind me. My past is always going to follow me no matter where I go, you know. But, you know, every day I try to make my crooked pass right. That's all I could do is to become a better person and just to go forward and do the best I can. Yeah, and we see. I mean, you're doing well now. You have your kids. You're working for a living. And you've really made something in your life. I try. Yeah. Um, so that that this was great, Jimmy. Um, if you don't mind, if any of the commenters have questions... If you don't mind, Jimmy, just taking a, a couple of quick sure, uh, cool. questions and talking to some commenters for a minute because I always, I always try to get them involved. Um, let's see. Anybody has some questions? Put them up now. Uh, Sis says you're doing great, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> Lee Troll the third. He wants to know uh, if you are still in touch with uh, Leah Ramini. I'm not in touch with Leah Ramini. The last time I seen Leah Ramini was in the underground disco many years ago. Me and her, we saw each other. At the time when I seen her, she was actually doing some show with some models. And we saw each other. And we hugged and we kissed. I made out with her. Uh, 
And that's the last time I seen her. And she went off to California to become a movie star. Another amazing part to your story, really. Yeah. Yep. Uh, George Gallione says, your actions uh, show self-improvement. Bless you, Jimmy. Thank you. Westside Conway wants to know, do you still have the blue Fila jacket? I tell you, you know what? When I went away, all these jogging suits I had, you know, I used to buy jogging suits every Friday. I would go to Central Sports on McDonald Avenue and buy new sneakers and jogging suits. And when I went away, I gave all my jogging suits to my brother and all my cousins. I said, yeah, let them keep them because I'm not going to be able to use them. But I wish I had all those old school jogging jogging suits because the old school ones are the best. Yeah, they definitely were. Um, I loved them too back then. Yeah. Uh, my whole life, really. Uh, Greg Scavuzzo says, thank you, Jimmy, and God bless. Um, Mickey Griggs says, fantastic interview. Uh, Go to Life wants to know any graffiti stories. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of graffiti stories. You know, back in the day, we always had markers on us when we were kids. And if you were taking a train ride, you were always, you know, tag up and, you know, put your name up. If your friends weren't with you, you'd throw them up too. But at nighttime, you know, we would hit, we would bomb the sanitation yards, the bus yards. And then the next morning, the bus would come down Bath Avenue with the sanitation trucks and we would be all over them. I said, wow, look, look, you're up. Wow, you threw me up. You know, but uh, that's how it was back then. You know, the graffiti was the best back then, you know. Actually, I want to give a shout out if you can. Uh, go search Graffiti Mouth. He's on IG. He's uh, really into the graffiti thing. He's really cool. Check him out. And uh, I want to also plug someone's book that it's called Bitchin' in the Kitchen by Janine DeToro. That's Big Angel's sister. I just want to give her a plug. So check out her Bitchin' in the Kitchen. You know, I just want to help people, you know, if they're looking to do something with themselves and their life as far as, uh, you know, selling something, check out that book, Bitching in, in the Kitchen. is pretty cool. And it's Big Angel's sister, so check it out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Cleveland Corleone says, thanks for coming on, Jimmy. How did you hook up with FBS? <laughs> well, I hooked up. I don't even remember how I hooked up. I think something with a shirt. I'm not sure. Yeah, the first, the first uh, connection was – my wife had actually emailed you and asked you to send me a shirt for, uh, I think it might have been for Father's Day. And I sent you a shirt. Yeah, yeah. You sent I, I sent you a shirt. And then we just, uh, I don't know, then from there we started talking. And, uh, you know, he seemed pretty sincere to me. And, uh, you know, then we became friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Sheldon Colbert, this is a funny question. He wants to know, Jimmy, have you ever heard of Anthony Ray Mundy? You know what? It's funny you ask this question because I watched this video the other day with you and Stax. And I have to say, listen, you know what? I like the kid Stax, okay? Because I believe in second chances in life. And if someone has issues in their life, I believe that Stax is trying to fix his life and do better in life. And I hope he gets to reform a relationship with his daughter because that's very important. Now, this guy, Anthony Ramonde, he did mention, I think, Angelo Sabe. Yeah. Angelo Seppi. He Angelo mentioned Seppi. Angelo Seppi and the girl who got killed with Angelo Seppi is Joanne. Okay? Now, Joanne's brother, John, had a aquarium on Bath Avenue between Bay 16th and Bay 17th. So I knew Joanne when they killed Angelo Seppi and Joanne on uh, Shorehaven Apartments in the garage. That was in the early 80s, 81, 82, around that time. Now, I looked at this guy. Now, I can't say that his whole story is bullshit. I think some of his story is true. But I think he's making himself out to be more than what he was. Yeah, you don't. I mean, 
Other than that, you've never heard his name, right? Never think... heard of him before. Who knows? He might have changed his name. I don't know. But when he mentioned Angelo Seppi, now Angelo Seppi was a fucking crazy man back in the day. He was a major coke cat. He loved to do cocaine. And uh, Joanne, she had more balls than him, too. I mean, she used to carry a pistol. So, But this is the time where the Latanza heist went down, and then they killed Angelo Seppi, and she was in the car. They killed her, too, in the Shore Haven Apartments in my neighborhood. So uh, I do remember Angelo Seppi when he mentioned Angelo Seppi. But uh, this guy, i never seen him before. But a couple of things he says... I remember, but I think he's making himself to be more out more than what he is. Yeah. You know, but I don't think he's a wise guy, 100%. Yeah, no, me neither. And I knew that question was going to come up in this chat. Um, uh, Rick Laponte says, Jimmy, I really think you're a stand up guy. Wishing you the best. Thank you. BOB Chillin says, Chris, ask him about the reality show he was doing. He said it was coming back. When? What reality show is he talking about? Yeah, I'm not sure either. I don't know. Um, JC West Coast says, nice, Jimmy. Uh, Martin Verzani uh, wants to know any, this is a good question because I want to know too, any new info, info on a Bath Avenue movie? Well, you know what? I would love for that to happen. I had a lot of conversations with some people, but Unfortunately, Hollywood is another crime family and, you know, they want everything for free and I'm not looking to give nobody nothing for free as far as my life rights. But if, you know, anyone's out there, they want to reach out, I'm easy to find. I would love to do a Bad Day Avenue movie, a Bad Day Avenue series. That would be great because it'll really, really be uh, dope to do something like that. Absolutely. Then Gray Line says, that's what a real gangster is. Admitting one's own faults, trials, and tribulations, accepts responsibility, and is remorseful remorseful for their actions. Everyone deserve, deserves a second chance. Respect, Jimmy. Thank you. Respect to you. Cuban B wants to know, uh, Her he says, Herbie Sperling, funny story? I guess he's asking if you Herbie have Sper Herbie Sperling was a true blue gangster. I loved Herbie Sperling. Herbie Sperling in Lewisburg Penitentiary, they have the movie theater there. And every weekend, we would go up to the movie theater and watch movies. Friday nights, Saturday nights, and Herbie Sperling had the two front rows. The front row and the second row was Herbie Sperling's. He would slap me with a stack of napkins and he would go like this, Jimmy, go upstairs and put the napkins on the first two rows. And I would walk the red top with Herbie Sperling and Herbie Sperling got nothing but respect in Lewisburg Penitentiary. He was a mad hatter and a stand up guy. And I had the pleasure to be in his company, even Manny Madonna to this day, no matter what they call me, no matter what, I love those two guys. They showed me the way of doing time and I respect them forever. Yeah. Um, Nick Pietro asks, FBS, can you ask him where he did his eight years after cooperating? I did my eight years basically in the hole, and I went to Allenwood. Allenwood was, uh, they have a unit over there with other people that cooperate. So I was in the hole, and I was in that. I only stayed in one spot. I didn't go shuffle around. I was not a problem child, and uh, that's basically where I did my time. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Billy T said, ask Jimmy about the Bay Parkway boys. The Bay Parkway boys were a bunch of rough kids. They were tough kids just like us. Uh, they have a lot of murders. They were around the Colombo crime family. They did a lot of things. They killed some of their own friends. and. Uh, you know, they killed uh, a judge. I think they killed a, a police officer. They were really uh, serious guys. They were. And, uh, you know, we had beefs with them. Uh, Paulie G put the kid Richard Greaves in a coma. He, uh, you know, he didn't like him. Paulie G killed oh. the kid OJ. Me personally, I was friends with OJ's sister, Rafif. And uh, when this happened, you know, I didn't know it was coming from Paulie G, but, uh, you know, Chestnut and Paulie G, 
you know, they were wilding out back in the day. That's how it was. You know, you made a name for yourself in the neighborhood. That's how you got your respect. You know, unfortunately, you know, there's another side to that coin where, you know, you got to pay a price and, you know, you kill, eventually you're going to get killed. You know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You know, nothing good came out of none of this. A lot of families cried. It's just, you know, it's a sad story. Yeah, very. Um, <clears throat> this is a good question. I wonder this too. Jo Johan Hermans wants to know, uh, did you know the Gem Gemini Twins Testa and Center? I did not know them. I heard a lot of stories about them, but personally, I did not know them. But I knew Nino Gaggi. He was from my neighborhood, and Nino Gaggi was a gangster, and uh, he was a class act. But uh, we used to shovel his house when we were kids, and uh, he was very particular of what he wanted done. He wanted to make sure there was a path through the driveway, in the driveway from the door, but he was a character, Nino Gaggi. Yeah. Um, here's another one. What did Tommy Karate sound like? Tommy Karate had a voice where everyone says it was Mickey Mouse. To me, it wasn't Mickey Mouse. It was more like, uh, like he would talk like this. Yeah, read me this article. Like that. Something like, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. So that's how Tommy Karate sounded. Yeah. I always heard that about him. Um, B.O.B. Chillin says, ask Jimmy if he knows Lou Ferranti. I don't know Lou Ferranti. No, I don't. Never met him. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, Jimmy. Uh, I'm not going to keep you on too much longer. You gave me an hour and 40 minutes. You have no idea how much I appreciate this. Uh, this is something, you know, like I said, I've read your story and been researching your crew for years. So to me, this is amazing. Uh, I appreciate you doing this because I know you don't do many interviews and I know you've turned a lot down. So uh, I just well, want to. Thank you. Well, I promised you this interview a while ago. You know, unfortunately, you know, that guy slowed things down. But, uh, you know, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Honorano Restorations. These people help me with my website. They're really good people. They, uh, you know, they send me a lot of love. Uh, like I said, Graffiti Mouth on IG, check him out. And uh, Michael Bickens from Philadelphia, that's my guy out there. He gave me a lot of respect, VIP seats at the Art of War. And, uh, you know, basically that's it. All right. Well, yeah, um, like I said, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I usually stay on for a little after interviews and just talk to the commenters and stuff. So um, I'll let you go. But again, uh, thanks. And this was a fantastic interview. So uh, you don't know how much I appreciate it. Well, today, well, today hopefully you get over 3,000. Yes, that's what I'm hoping for. And I think it's going to happen. It's looking that way already. Uh, all right, guys, listen to all my supporters, to all the good people out there. I love you people. Thank you for supporting me and sending me the love right back at you, man. I appreciate right. you. Yeah, and thanks again, Jimmy, and I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye, Jimmy. Bye. Uh, that was great, guys. Uh, went better than I thought. I kept Jimmy on forever. I know. Um, I wanted to try to keep it to, you know, 90 minutes, but I had so much to ask and I didn't want to miss anything. So, you know, uh, I appreciate Jimmy for filling in all those blanks, telling us about people like John uh, Padone and Charlie Calco and um, giving us some extra stories that I don't even think he's spoken about um, on his own show. Uh, that was fantastic. So I'm going to read some comments and then I'll get going as well. Because uh, I need to eat dinner soon. Uh, Uberfly says, great job. FBS, thank you. Michael McDonald, that was dope. Thank you. Richard Bettencourt, thanks, FBS. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for watching. Miss Can't Be Wrong says, really enjoyed it. Um, Edward Ever, two awesome days, bro. Thank you, man. Come Smoke the Don, that was awesome. Art Kunkel says, good dude. Um, Let's see. Uh, Nina Shabetta, that was dynamite. Thank you, man. Uh, These Nuts BK says, great job. Martin Rizzoni, great one, FBS. Um, Kelly G's, 
You did a great job, man. You also did not bring up certain negative people who have channels that are jealous. I'm proud of you, dude. Awesome. Yeah, that's something I want you guys to know. You know, people expect that when I do these interviews that right away I'm going to bring up a light. I'm going to try to trash people and stuff. That's not what this was about. Uh, this was about Jimmy's story uh, and the story of the Bath Avenue crew. It's something you got to understand that, you know, uh, I've been waiting a long time to do. I never thought it was going to happen. Uh, well, before I started this channel, it never even occurred to me that I'd get to interview Jimmy someday. But I've done a lot of research on their story. I think it's one of the most fascinating stories, you know, of, of that time uh, in that life. So, you know, I thank you guys, too, for showing up. I think we were up to like 710 people, something like that. Just amazing. So, you know, thank you to all you guys. And thank you to everybody that's subscribing and liking the video. Uh, I'm up to 2,994, guys. So who knows? Maybe by the time I get off, I'll be at 3,000 subscribers. Um, let's see what else some of you guys have to say, and then I'm going to go. Neil Constantino says, FBS killing it. Thank you. Um, I have you guys to thank for, for any kind of success I'm having on here or any of these experiences uh, I get to have. It's all thanks, thanks to you guys. So uh, you're all my heroes. Trust me. Joe Mags, uh, 1980, says, good stuff, FBS. Mickey Griggs, uh, that's what you call asking the tough questions. Yeah, you know, I always I get uncomfortable asking some of these things. And you could see uh, Jimmy breaking down when he was telling that story. Um, so it's hard for me to do. But if I'm going to, you know, find out the story of the Bath Avenue crew for you guys, you can't leave certain things out. And Jimmy told me before, ask me anything. So got to give it to him. Gunsmoke to Don, you know, FBS, I gave you a special shout out on my recent video. Love your channel. But thank you, Gunsmoke. I appreciate that. Uh, Vince Romano, a great show, FBS and JC. Thank you. Um, Sheldon Colbert, FBS, you could do a part two with Jimmy C. That was a great show. Maybe someday, yeah. Um, Westside Conway says, I feel like I got made now. <laughs> now I feel like I got made. <laughs> Grim Sleeper 421, I can honestly say. That's probably the best interview I've ever seen. Well, thank you. That's uh, that's amazing to hear. Queenie Gambino, salute, God bless. Thank you. Italian Stallion, bottom line, uh, Jimmy's the real deal. He is, regardless what anybody wants to say about him. Um, Gunsmoke to Don FBS, please watch my most recent video. I will. Um, Miss Kent, oh, shit, I lost it. Hold on. I'm going to go find you. Wait. Um, Miss Can't Be Wrong says FBS and Shanna are easy to talk to. Thank you. I saw something else from you I wanted to click on. Uh, Miss Can't Be Wrong, yeah. She said Jimmy had no problem being honest, even through, even though uh, the truth hurts sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, without a doubt. Uh, DMS, good ally to have FBS. Thank you for not saying the A word. Yeah, no, it wasn't, a, it wasn't in my plan. I wasn't going to make this about him. Tommy Agro, great job, FBS, but you didn't ask if he committed any crimes with Anthony Raimondi. Oh, shit, I must have forgot. <laughs> Apex Predator 69, I can't miss you. Uh, FBS, Jimmy really opened, to you, opened up to you. All the respect, as always, brother. Thank you, Frankie. And same to you, man. Anthony Sparrow, Avian Crime Family, I could never forget you. Here's an interview you should shoot for, Roy DeMeo's son. Uh, maybe. Um, Stax was talking mad shit about you, FBS. Was he really? Well, if so, that's a shame. Uh, I never said a bad word about Stax. I hope that's not true. Um, but anyway, guys, I'm going to go. Um, I got to go eat some dinner. I want to thank all of you for showing up. Everybody who, who uh, stuck with us through the whole interview. If you're a new subscriber, look at that. 3,000 subscribers, guys. I just got it. So now I got to take a couple of more minutes and, uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody from my first subscriber to my last and everybody in between. Thank you so much. 
Um, 3,000 subs is huge for me. Like I said, I never imagined I'd even get to 1,000. So that gives me a whole other reason to be excited. And um, I'll give Shanna the good news in a little bit. Thank you so much, guys. And keep subscribing. Like this video. Hit the notification bell. And um, until then, I love you all. And thanks again. I'll see you next time. Salute.